I am so pleased to have Erica Wharton join us today. Erica is a current Larimer County Master Gardener, and she is also the program coordinator for the Loveland Youth Gardeners Program in Loveland. She will explain that amazing program that we've had a partnership with for over 20 years. And she is also a certified horticultural therapist. And so she is here to talk to us about hort therapy, what it means, and how uh, we are really doing it every day in our lives. So thank you, Erica, for joining us. I will turn it over to you. You can share your screen, and we'll go ahead and get started. And if you have questions, put them in the chat. And Erica will have plenty of time at the end to do that and answer your questions. Awesome. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you guys see my screen OK, hopefully? Should have a really cute kid planting some lavender on it. Um, so uh, I am um, super excited to be here today to chat with you guys about horticulture therapy. Um, I normally do this presentation in person, and so it's really weird not to be able to see any of your guys' beautiful faces. <laughs> So um, let's uh, start off with, I want everybody to take a 30 seconds to think about gardening and how it benefits you. And if you don't mind typing something into the chat about um, what benefits you get from either working with your vegetables or giving produce to people or planting, um, I would love to kind of think about all, see all the benefits that you guys, <laughs> cheaper than therapy. You're right, that therapy is really expensive. So fresh air, exercise, good food. That's right, gardening just makes my heart happy. You're right, that's right. Connects us to big, something bigger, groundedness, right? That's, that's huge. Um, it's also a great place for me to kind of get my frustrations out. I have known to give things uh, too big of a heart haircut when I'm feeling a little frustrated. <laughs> Uh, my kids do know that if I have my headphones on and I'm out in my vegetable garden that they need to not come and ask me a question for a little while. Relaxation, that's right. So many things to observe. That's right. Observing things help to settle our mind, kind of stop the noise that might be in our head. Ah, the scent of the soil. That's right. In the quiet place. Yeah, these are all great reasons why we get out, right? So um, I love that. Keep, keep them coming. Sharing food. Oh, yes, I love feeding people. I think it's fantastic. So, all right, let's get started. So this is a picture of me um, as a young girl with my father. Uh, he uh, was an amazing gardener. He is the reason why I started growing uh, vegetables. He could grow a tomato like no other not nobody else. And so we gardened all the time together. Um, we had a garden in El Paso, Texas, very different soil, super sandy um, and super hot. And we were planting tomatoes like in February. So very different than what I have here. So 10 years ago, I convinced him to come and live in Colorado. And so he came and our roles as gardening kind of changed. I did all the physical work because he couldn't do it. Um, and he told me what I was doing wrong <laughs> or suggestions on how to do things. And so it was our time together. Um, very unexpectedly, he got sick one day and he passed away the, a week later. Um, and so I, at the time, was an executive director of a lo local nonprofit. And um, I just didn't know what I wanted to do. I just felt this call that I needed to do something else. I love working with at-risk youth. And so one night my husband and I were drinking beers and I was like, God, there's gotta be something I can do. And so we Googled horticulture and therapy or at-risk youth and horticulture therapy popped up. And so uh, CSU had a program. And so I left my nonprofit. It was quite shocking to a lot of people. And I went and went back to school to learn about horticulture therapy. Um, as I was telling people that I was going to go do horticulture therapy, I got a lot of crazy looks. <laughs> and so this is kind of a little meme that I found that I thought was really kind of appropriate. People literally thought I was going to talk to plants. I was going to provide therapy <laughs> to plants. And so, I mean, I even had some really good friends ask me that and I was thought they were joking, but sadly, um, they were not <laughs> joking. And so, um, so what is horticulture therapy? Um, so the horticulture therapy is defined by the American Horticulture Therapy Institute as an engagement 
of a person in gardening and plant-based activities facilitated by a trained therapist to achieve specific therapeutic treatment goals. Um, horticulture therapists are the people that run horticulture therapy, obviously. And so we are professionals with specific education, training, and credentials in the use of horticulture for therapy and rehabilitation, rehabilita rehabilitation, rehabilitation, gosh, I can't talk. Um, so how is that different than therapeutic horticulture? So all of these benefits that we just kind of brainstormed, put in the chat, those are all here horticulture therapeutics. So those are programs, activities that we do in nature that bring us some relief, some therapeutic. They don't have a lot of structure, so they don't necessarily have goals assigned to it. I mean, besides the fact that we're going to go out and we're going to harvest tomatoes, there isn't any kind of treatment defined to it. So uh, horticulture therapy activities meet really specific therapeutic or rehabilitation goals for our participants. So we try to focus on maximizing social, cognitive, physical, and or psychological functioning to enhance general health and wellness. So I was trying to think when I was preparing for this presentation is I didn't know a lot about the history and I love trivia and I like to nerd out. So I figured I would kind of share with you some of the things that I found about history of horticulture therapy. So uh, in 2000 BC, um, ancient uh, Mesopotamia, they first record of using horticulture to calm the senses. Um, that was, you know, quite a while ago. In 500 BC, uh, ancient Parisians uh, created gardens to soothe the senses. Um, and uh, ancient Euro Egyptian physicians, they were the first documented case of uh, physicians prescribing garden-centered activities um, for, uh, for their clients, so, you know, walking around the garden. These were for uh, patients that had mental illness. During the Middle Ages, uh, there was, on the grounds of a Montessori hospital, plants were used to cheer up, um, uh, cheer up uh, patients that were melancholy. They also used gardens to treat both physical and medical concerns. Um, also, in 1978, Dr. Benjamin Rush, he was one of our um, signers of the Declaration of Independence, and he's also supposed to be known as the first psychiatrist. He was the first to suggest that field labor in a farm setting helped attain positive outcomes for clients with mental illness. Um, this discovery was pretty important because it led uh, many hospitals in Western world to begin using horticulture as a means to start therapeutic, uh, therapeutically treating patients with mental health and developmental disabilities. So in 1870, there was a friend's hospital. It was actually an asylum. The name is pretty horrible. It's called Asylum for Persons Deprived of Their Reason. And so they were also known as a friend's hospital, but they constructed the first kind of environment that was a park-like setting. So it had, you know, more, more paths through it. And it was an effort to assist patients with their recovery. And in, uh, you know, 1879, they actually built their first greenhouses to assist that. And it was used solely for therapy. Um, in 1896, there was a book, um, which is a long title called Darkness and Di Daylight or Lights and Shadows of New York Life. And this is the earliest mention of using plants and gardening to, uh, as beneficial activities for troubled youth. So that's pretty cool. Um, Post-World War II, uh, horticulture therapy was used to help servicemen rehabilitate. And in 1952, Michigan State University created the first uh, workshop to train people in horticulture therapy. In 1955, they started the first master's degree program for horticulture therapy for occupational therapists. So occupational therapists are people who work on helping, uh, like kind of like physical therapy, occupational therapy, they help to kind of um, work on healing people, um, you know, their, their muscles and fatigue and things like that. And so uh, that this program at Michigan State was first developed for that. In 1972, Kansas State University became, began their undergraduate program in horticulture therapy. And then in 1973, the Council for Therapy and Rehabilitation through horticulture was established. This will be later renamed to the American Horticulture Therapy Association that we know today. They are the, they are the governors of our practice. Um, 
There is also in 1981, we had eight universities that offer bachelor's and master's degrees program in the US. Um, we also have today we have seven universities that are affiliate or seven programs that are affiliated with the universities that have certificate programs in the US. I attended the Horticulture Therapy Institute, which is outside of Denver, um, and they are affiliated with CSU, and so that's where I did my coursework. And now, today, there is training all over the world, um, and so um, it's, it's pretty impressive how this has grown. So types of treatment. Um, we have a, a three main areas of treatment that we use when we're uh, implementing our programs. So the first one is vocational horticulture therapy. This is intended to teach skills and enhance behaviors so that we can that they can be used in a job or workplace. This is pretty common in a lot of horticulture therapy pro programs and and it's what um, Loveland Youth Gardeners has done from the very beginning. Therapeutic horticulture has a focus on medical and illness recovery. So they really focus on physical, mental, or biological aspects of a disease and illness and emphasize clinical diagnosis and the medical intervention associated with those diagnoses and symptoms. Another really big common one is wellness and social. These are uh, programs that are focused on the general well being and quality of life, as opposed to specific vocational and clinical improvements. This focuses on growth of the whole person rather than the development of specific skills. So, as you can imagine, all of these types of programs, they all overlap, right? So for example, um, Loveland Youth Gardeners, we teach primarily vocational skills. That's our goal is to help youth learn the skills so they can have an employment and better their lives. But we do a lot of social emotional learning as well. So self-management and self-regulation because you can't really chew out your boss and expect to keep your job, right? So we see a lot of these overlaps in the programs um, that utilize horticulture therapy. So um, what's really cool is horticulture therapy can be used with a lot of other therapies. Um, and that's where you see a lot of the work being done. So there's a whole bunch of things. Occupational therapy, um, occupational therapy, you know, and physical therapy, if you think about it, uh, if you've ever done it, you're usually in a gym or kind of a gym-like setting and you're working on muscle strength or hand-eye coordination. And so occupational therapy and horticulture therapy using a garden or plants, you know, you can, you can make it look like, uh, you, you make it a lot more fun than actually just kind of lifting weight. So uh, reaching overhead to water a hanging pot, uh, pruning or deadheading a plant or potting up, those are the skills that they can kind of um, use to implement their goals. Speech therapy is another really great opportunity. I had a, a classmate who was a speech therapist and she used horticulture therapy to get kids to talk without realizing that they were doing the talking. So sharing tools, talking about the plants that they were growing, um, stuff like that. And so it was a great opportunity for them to, to utilize these goals in this setting. Obviously there's therapeutic recreation. We see that a lot. Art therapy, music therapy, mental health counseling, special education and vocational rehab. So these are um, some of our partners that we partner with. So how does it in, uh, HT benefit the individual? Um, well, physically, right? So we get people moving. Sometimes some of our programs outside, sometimes our programs are inside um, in a greenhouse or even on a little cart that's brought to your room. So we're, you know, we're physically moving as much as possible. Um, cognitively, a lot of our, some of our goals could be recall. It could be sequencing. All of those kind of skills, um, we, they, uh, we can create pr uh, programs or activities that help the individual that way. Emotionally, like I was just speaking about, self-regulation, self-management, uh, grief work is very big in horticulture therapy, um, and also socially, right? So let's give some examples. So if we think about a person with developmental disability, working in a vocational horticulture program brings a sense of pur purpose and belonging. So uh, I see that a lot. So with clients who um, have you know, have an eating disorder. I have seen that plant activities in a therapeutic setting offers a process to work through anxiety and unhealthy relationship dynamics. Um, I have seen elders 
with dementia and in a wellness horticulture therapy program offer an opportunity to participate with others in a non-threatening activity. And so these are all great ways. So I, um, my, one of my professors, Rebecca Holler, she had a beautiful way to kind of explain how this modality was beneficial. And so this is a quote from her. And I, and I think it really kind of explains it really well. So if you think about the first shoot that comes out of a garden, right? And, and while it's, you know, has a lot of potential sticking out from this barren earth, there's so much more activity going on below the ground that make this modality a compelling statement for changing in the lives of others. One of the greatest tools that we have as horticulture therapy are metaphors. And so the garden provides many of those opportunities. And so I am a huge soil nerd. I love all things that have to do with soil. And so I tend to use soil and the work that we do to create really good soil to kind of explain to our kids that, you know, we do a lot of things in, with our soil. We add organic matter. We, we do what all the different things that we do. And we don't really know how well our soil web is until we plant those plants and see how they respond, right? And so I, I kind of explain that to our kids. I, I talk to them about all their work that they're doing internally, and it might take a while for people in their circle or in their lives, in their community, to see the work that they're doing. And that doesn't mean they're not doing good work. It just means it's kind of under the covers. So um, you will find me always looking for metaphors or stories on how I can relate gardening to the work that they're doing. Um, so where is horticulture therapy being practiced? Um, there's a lot of areas in our community. Uh, psychiatric, psychi psychiatric hospitals and mental health programs are an area where we're seeing horticulture therapy being used. In some of these places, they don't necessarily have a garden that they take people out to. They may be lucky um, to have that, but they could be a cart. I have a lot of uh, mentors who are horticulture therapists, and they do a lot of work on a cart, right? They bring the stuff to the patient, and they're working with them. Um, I've seen it in vocational, occupational, and rehabilitation programs. Uh, substance abuse programs. So our director at Loveland Youth Gardeners uh, is also a horticulture therapist, and she created a program in sus uh, with substance abuse, and it was really great for people to be able to nurture and take care of something while they were going through their treatment. Uh, hospitals, clinics, and skilled nursing facilities. There's a big movement for that. Um, my grandmother lives in an assisted living place um, care facility, and they have a lot of people who have these kind of activities available for them. They're more, they're not necessarily outside, they're more geared inside around a table, but she loves it. And the recall of memories is powerful when she smells some of the plants that they work with. Hospice and palliative care programs, um, pathways here in, uh, in our area. I did an internship with them. They have a beautiful garden and they are really working on their grief programs and bringing horticulture therapy to all of the different modalities that they provide. Correctional facilities. This is something, there's a lot of really great research out there showing um, how horticulture therapy can help um, the, uh, the inmates kind of work towards understanding, you know, and giving back to the community and having something that they're proud, they're, they're happy for or proud of. We see it in public and private schools. Lots of schools are trying to go back to being education outside and hands-on and not necessarily at a desk. Um, community and botanical gardens. Uh, the Denver Botanical Gardens has a, math, uh, has a horticulture therapist there, Angie, and she is fantastic. Not only does she create programs there um, for their uh, gardens, but she also brings other agencies in and builds programs for their populations. Assisted living and senior centers, like I mentioned before, residential settings such as foster care, homeless shelters, therapeutic farms, those are up and coming a lot with horticulture therapy. Physical rehabilitation hospitals. This is another great one. Uh, down in Denver, we have Craig Hospital. I'm not sure if anybody has experienced that, but they do um, patients who have had spinal injuries and their horticulture therapist comes to their room on a, with a cart and she has activities. And it has been really, um, a lot of research has been done there to show just how healing it is and how, how it helps to shorten their stay <clears throat> while they're there at the center. Um, obviously health promotion and wellness programs are another big piece. 
So horticulture therapy at Loveland Youth Gardeners, this is what I focus on. Um, we have two uh, main areas with uh, regards to horticulture therapy. So um, our main programs, uh, they used to be called uh, uh, YGP, Leaf Out, and Enterprise. They're now called LEAD, and that is our Leadership Exploration and Development Program. And so it's a vocational program, like I had mentioned before. We do focus on a lot of social emotional learning, self-regulation, self-management. And our goal is that as our youth navigate through the different levels, that they learn those skills that they need to be successful um, with employment. Um, and so um, that is our main program that we have been doing for a long time. And so now we have a set of horticulture therapy programs um, that we call them Repair to Grow. And so our first one is with Community Connections. They are young adults ages 18 to 21 that are still receiving services from our school district. They have uh, uh, developmental delays and they are um, working on vocational skills. They're also working on how to work in the public safely, right? So we um, work with them on vocational skills. We teach them the vocational skills with regards to setting up growing small seedlings and then having a small plant sale at the end of the season where they sell the plants that they grew. Our next new program is, re is with restorative justice. So youth um, in Fort Collins who have, um, you know, did a, have had a crime or they've gotten caught for something, they, some of them have an opportunity to enter a restorative justice program versus going into uh, the courts and then potentially into prison, depending on the offense. And so they are required to do a, a set of activities that help to repair the harm to our community. Uh, this restorative justice programs, uh, there's a lot of different components to it. One of them is they have to have community service. They have to work on healing um, the community and to the victim what they, the crime that they did. But they also are as, um, assigned to an agency to work on some therapeutic goals. And so for us at Loveland Youth Gardeners, we created a program for them to repair, to work on the repair that they've done to themselves. And so we uh, do this with storytelling. It's a three, um, it's a closed group that runs for a month. We have three sessions with these students. And so we talk about the stories, right? So what is, what does society think their story is? What is the story they've actually lived? And then how do we explain to them and teach them that the chapter, that these are just chapters in their life. This is not their entire story. We do this by a lot of different ways. We use horticulture therapy. We will bring in art therapy in and music therapy. And then we will also be doing some group work together. That's a very cool program. I'm really excited about that one. Our other one is um, the district attorney's office has a very similar program tracked so that um, some of our youth or young adults, instead of going into the courts, they have a diversion program that they can experience. And so it's very kind of similar. They have to set a requirements that they have to do and participate. There is a community service component to it where they have to go in the community and work on um, giving back to the community, but they also has a lot more therapeutic elements to it. And so we are building a program for their boys ages 10 to 18 years of old, 18 years of age. And they're, it's going to be very similar to our lead program. So we're teaching those vocational skills, but it will have a more focus on uh, self-regulations, um, self-management, and some of those therapeutic goals so that they can learn how to you know, work as a group and how to kind of manage their emotions a little bit better. Um, that is an eight week program and it runs on Fridays. Um, our other program that we're building that I'm really excited about is a girls diversion program. So these are girls who have offenses like they shoplifted condoms, they shoplifted tampons because they either don't have the support at home or for whatever reason, right? So they're not horrible offenses, but as they dived in to look at these youth, they realized that 
um, they had some really inappropriate sexting um, behaviors, and that makes them a risk for trafficking. And so they have a therapist and a survivor that will be working with me, and I will be turning their interventions or their activities into a horticulture therapy focus at the farm. Um, that will be a closed group, a small session, and hopefully we'll be helping to teach these girls that they are more than enough than what society has told them. So what does a horticulture therapy session look like? I get this a lot. Um, this is one of our students in this photo who is um, part of our community connections. And so she is working on a lot of uh, uh, cognitive skills. So we are doing the winter sowing method right now to grow our seedlings um, for the farm and for their plant sale. And so she's working on hand eye coordination. She's also working on sequencing. Um, and she's also working on communicating um, her needs as well as what's kind of going on. She's leading a small group. You can't see it in this photo. So every session plan that I write has these components. They have goals for the activity. They have objectives for the group. Obviously, I list the materials that we'll need, how to prepare for the activity, the setup, uh, the instructions on how the session plan will go. And then I also talk about the assessment plans and the documentation that I can track while I'm watching this goal. So let me explain an activity to you. I have this activity that's a seed ball activity, and it's really an external way for our participants to kind of manipulate their baggage. So for the goals of the activity, I set some goals like to identify the hurtful baggage we carry around with us every day, to externally work with this hurtful baggage and change it into a new life, and to identify support systems and self-care routines that we have in place to help with this bag. Uh, this baggage. So our objectives uh, for the group would be, you know, every, I'm hoping that everyone shares, maybe answers a prompt at least once. I'm hoping that people um, in the group initiate conversation with at least one peer, not just with myself. Um, also, I'm looking for people to ask questions and share, right? That's, that's kind of purpose. So let me walk you through the activity. If we were together, we would do this activity. But so um, I would give everybody a piece of paper, note card size, and I would have them write down something that they carry with them. It could be a hurtful, a hurtful thought that they kind of replay in their mind. It could be maybe something that was tragic that happened and they, they, they just carry it with them all the time. And, and I probably would have them include the feelings that are um, centered around that, that they carry. And so everybody will write that on their piece of paper and then I asked to see if there's anybody in our group that wants to share. Sometimes people want to share. It depends on the group dynamic. Are we a new group or are we a group that had been working together for a while? Regardless, um, I usually participate and I usually share my baggage or some part of it to get the conversation starting. I then have them take the, the paper and tear it apart. Um, transform it. You know, I get, I tried to be kind of the actress and be like, you know, kind of dramatic. I'm tearing my paper up and, you know, uh, uh, throwing it into the bowl and really kind of try to have them manipulate this baggage externally. And so once we have torn it into pieces, we throw it in our ball and I add water to it. And I tell everybody to start, you know, tearing down that paper more. And so as we know, when we add the water, we're, at, we're turning it into pulp, right? And, and as we look at that pulp, I'm asking people, can you see the words that you wrote down? How does this feel to add water to it? How does it feel to like see it? And now it's just like this goopy kind of mess that you can't tell, right? And so those are some of the kind of the prompts that I'm asking them. I then take um, some air dried clay that's not dried yet and I have them add it to their pulp. I tell them that this is, you know, some support systems that we're adding to our baggage. So what support systems do they have in the community that they can utilize? Is that a therapist? Is that a, a, a mentor that they reach out to? Is that a girlfriend they meet for coffee or whatever that is? And so we all go around and we kind of share. And it's not really formal, like where I'm asking everybody to participate. It's, it's just what moves people. And so by this time, usually I'm having a lot of people kind of talk about what, it, what, it, what, what their support systems are in place. Um, I'm also asking people, what does it look like? What, it, what does it feel like to have your hands and you're manipulating your baggage, right? Um, 
I then add compost. I give everybody compost and I tell them that this is our self-care routine. So what do you do? Are you drinking a cup of tea and having a muffin, right? Or is it more? Are you going to yoga? Are you participating in some group therapy? And so people will go around and kind of share what they do when they're feeling really weighed down with their baggage. So at this point, we have a mound <laughs> of stuff, right? We have our transformed pulp, we have our, our, our clay, and we have our compost. And so I have them divide them up into small balls. And we pick our native plant flower seeds and we add them to the ball. And I explained to them that we're adding new life to our baggage. And so we are hoping that by doing our new self-care routines and our new support systems that we can, you know, obviously we can't get rid of the baggage, right? It'll always stay with us, but we can, we can transform it into something that is less detrimental to us, but also kind of provide us some more to some new life. So we let the balls dry and then we come back and we plant them up into our garden. And so I think from what I have understood, what I've seen with the groups, I've done this with two groups. I've done this with my youth at Loveland Youth Gardeners. And then I also did it with a, a group of women who all had lost their moms. And that wasn't planned that way. It was a grief group, but we didn't realize that they had all lost their moms. And so it was such a different experience for everybody. You know, some people really got into tearing up that paper and really like it's tiny, tiny little pieces. And some people really just wanted to get their hands dirty. And, and, and also some people really wanted to hear ideas for what other people did for self-care routines and support systems. And so it was really powerful. And then when we planted our seeds and we had flowers that germinated from that, you know, it, it was such a beautiful representation that we transformed our baggage into new life. And so we can do that and with a lot of different aspects of our life. So it was pretty cool. So how do you become a horticulture therapist? So this is my group this summer. Um, these are our kids and this is, um, um, we just had such a great time. So all of our photos that I'm showing today are for the kids that I've worked with in the past. Um, so there's two ways to be a horticulture therapist. You can get a certificate in horticulture therapy um, and then you can also go on and get a professional registration. So um, to get a certificate in horticulture therapy, um, you can visit any of the seven university schools that are out there. Um, and the one that I went, the Horticulture Therapy Institute, they have four main classes that I did take. Um, and they really teach you um, quite a bit about horticulture, everything from techniques to the different populations to work with. Um, also, you know, documentation and how to do assessments, how to plan a program, how to manage a program. It's uh, Rebecca Holler does a very good job. Um, you can also then turn around and try to get a professional registration. And so that's what I'm currently doing right now. Um, you can have a bachelor's degree that has a concentration in horticulture therapy. That's a new option for those who are maybe just going back to school. But I had a degree in computer science. I was a software developer before I ran a nonprofit. And so I had to go back and get the additional coursework since I already had a bachelor's degree. And so for me, that was at least 12 hours of horticulture classes. And so I took greenhouse management, soil science, plant, public, uh, plant propagation, um, pest management, intro to I took a lot of classes. And then I also became a master gardener. So I also had all that education as well. Um, on the psychology side, you're required to take at least 12 hours, um, which is about four classes of classes in psychology and they provide lists of things that you should do. And so I took intro to psychology. I also took um, a child development and adult development until death. I took um, human sexuality. I took um, abnormal psychology and I also um, took a basic counseling class as well. After you have all your classes done, they um, require you to do a 480 hour internship. Um, and so I am very fortunate because 
my job at Level and Youth Gardeners allowed me to get paid and run my internship and, and do an internship there. So um, that's not the case for a lot of people. A lot of internships are free. Um, and so that's kind of a hard part. But another requirement for that is that you have to be supervised by a registered horticulture therapist. And there are not a lot of us. Um, so I found somebody in Denver. And so I have been working with her. She is um, my supervisor. And so we work together um, and she supervises, she comes up and has seen me three times, watches my, how I do things. And then we work together a couple times a month to kind of talk about concerns I have with some of the uh, participants I'm working with or how to reach people or how to, you know, really improve my horticulture therapy skills. Um, part of my internship requires me to do a lot of writing. So I have to create a bunch of interventions is what we call our activities. Um, and so the session plans that I mentioned earlier, I create a lot of those for Lovely Youth Gardeners. I also have to work on a long-term uh, project. And so for me, um, for our lead program, I created a student employee handbook because we're really trying to you know, drive in those vocational skills. So I developed that document, had it reviewed, and, and we will be using that next year. Uh, this, uh, my final area is a case study. So I have to pick a student or a participant in my program, and I have to follow them through their time with me in my internship. So set goals, um, have an understanding of their background, and then what is the outcome. So let's talk about my case study. I love to tell people um, how it works and why it's important. And so bear with me because this might be a little bit of a long story, but it's such an important one. So I picked a gentleman, he was 18. Um, overweight. His hygiene was pretty subpar. Uh, his uh, energy level was muted. And we often found him uh, just sitting around, super low energy. Um, he uh, was born addicted to meth. Um, he has no contact with his biological mother. His father was in and out of jail often. He was a senior in high school. Uh, he attends a local program in our school district uh, for students identified with mental health issues significant enough to prevent them from graduating and being self-sufficient. Um, he had problems at school with attendance. He had missed so much school that there was a good chance that he wasn't going to graduate. So his history is a sad, you know, is, is quite hard and, and troubling. He has this history of neglect, uh, drug exposure, physical and emotional abuse, abandonment, failed to thrive. Um, his parents were addicted to alcohol and drug addiction. Um, he lacked um, energy and had no stamina. Uh, when, he ups when he was upset, he shut down, right? And it didn't take much to cause him to shut down. Um, he hated to be touched. He did not like to communicate with them. I even found him in the middle of programming, reaching out to his mother, which is his great aunt, to um, help make decisions on what to do in the program. Um, he doesn't like to speak to others in our group. And he always told me he can never be a leader because um, he just, that's just not who he was. So he had a list of diagnosis, everything from ADHD to depression and anxiety, PTSD and IBS. He had um, a lot of medication that he was on and our garden, which is the photo behind me, is in full sun. We work hard at our program. And, um, and so not being, you know, not feeding your body well, um, it's hard work. And so he, we, we just found him to really just sit out. Um, he was very forgetful. He was, gets extremely frustrated. And I noticed that he had a really poor self-image. Um, he, he took a long time to process things and he kept telling me that he couldn't verbally uh, communicate really well and that he didn't really like to write or do math and that his teachers had just kind of pushed him through the classes. And so his main goal with us was to complete our program and earn science credit. Um, and so that is something that our lead program students have the ability to do. Um, and so 
but in order to in order for him to receive science credit he had to be there 80 percent of the time and his attendance was really poor um, by our first pay period because the students get paid twice a year oh twice a time twice a season with us you know, he had missed 10, 11 days. And so um, he was not on track to complete our program. And if he didn't complete our program and not earn science credit, then he wasn't going to graduate. Another big component of earning science credit with us is that you have to give a presentation. And so last year, I required our students to tell us the story of their bed. They were all required to pick a plant and a vegetable and grow it and then track what happened to it, what insects, how do they fertilize? How much did they harvest? What did they grow? What was the history of their vegetable? Um, this presentation is given to all of the volunteers who work with our students, all of our students, as well as their parents who wanted to come, and all of the staff and board members from Leveling Youth Gardeners. So there was easily 50 people who were there to watch this presentation. Um, so one day I, I was doing some charting and I realized that he was not going to make it. He was not going, he was not, I couldn't get him to come. And when I got him to come, he just was not, you know, interested in any of the activities. And I got really upset. I, I wasn't really sure how to reach him. I tried a lot of things and I just was at a loss. So I was actually in my garden weeding because I have a lot of weeds that I <laughs> needed to kind of take care of. And it just came to me. I don't know where it came from, but I thought I'm going to make him the potting shed leader. And it was kind of funny because I didn't really know what that meant and I had no idea where it was gonna go, but this is what I was gonna do. So the next morning I came to him and I said, okay, this is your plan. You will be my potting shed leader. We had a tiny little potting shed. Um, you know, it's not fancy. There's no <laughs> watering. You have to hand water or anything. And it was really hot. So I told him you had to maintain all of the little two inch pots that we have there. You have to water them, you have to fertilize them, you have to trim them. And any activity that relates to the potting shed with our group, you will run that, that activity for me. And he kind of looked at me like, mm -hmm, like, uh, sure, okay, lady, you're crazy, right? Um, and so, <laughs> but it was beautiful because every day he showed up. I told him, I was like, if you can't come, I don't have a sub for you. So nobody else will water those plants and they will die. And I thought that was a little tricky. I thought I was being a little harsh, but he showed up. He came and he took care of those plants and he fertilized. And when I, you know, I, I would work with him on a variety of goals. So I do a lot of verbal um, uh, instruction to him and I had to make him write those instructions down so that he could remember and that was a lot of hard work for him because he was really embarrassed to write and so we did those things together at first and then eventually he was writing in shorthand on a dry erase board what those tasks were. I also started to give him small tasks that had to other uh, other peers in the group come to him to work with and so he started leading those peers. He didn't really know he was leading those peers. In his mind, he thought leadership was a big group. And so I started with kids that were more easygoing and he loved it, right? And he loved that sense of being a leader and in charge and ownership of something. Another requirement of all the students is that they have to give tours at the farm. We get a lot of visitors who come in to either buy produce or they just come in because they want to see what we're doing. And I assign kids as needed to give those tours. And so the first time I told him he was gonna do a tour before he had this role, he looked at me like, no way, I'm gonna leave, right? And so after I had given him this task, he became one of the best tour givers. He would walk through the garden, he would point out his plants, but when he stopped at the potting shed, he would do like an eight, 10 minute talk about all the things that the potting shed did and why it was important and how he loved it. and. It was beautiful. Um, I'm happy to report <laughs> that his attendance skyrocketed after that. After the second pay period, he only missed, I think he missed three, three program dates. And then he helped me find a sub for those, like a sub in the, in the program that could water for him. And so he was able to receive science credit. He did an amazing job on his presentation too, as well. And so which was shocking. And his teacher was there and she was floored to see him speak about the things that he grew. And so he received science credit for him, from us and he graduated in December. Um, and so 
I wish I had more time with him. I wish I had two more years with him to kind of really reinforce these skills that we had initially started. But it was such a beautiful demonstration of how we can use our garden to reach these kids that really have, have been kind of just pushed aside and not really, they always become whatever their problem is. They become problem children or whatever the, the ridiculous labels that we put on in society. But for, for this student, he was able to nurture something and that nurtured himself. So it was awesome. Um, okay, I've talked enough. <laughs> so here are some uh, links to get more information. So if you want to learn more about the American Horticulture Therapy Association, you can see, I can visit their website. They have a great information. They talk in detail about um, our, program, our programs and how to become a horticulture therapist. Um, you can learn more about the Horticulture Therapy Institute by visiting their website. Um, they have a great classes and are a great network um, of horticulture therapist. You can also learn more about Loveland Youth Gardeners. That's our website and, and all the programs that we provide to the communities. We're always looking for volunteers in different capacities to help out with the work that we do. And also that's my work email. Um, you guys also as master gardeners have access to my cell phone number, but if you ever wanted to talk more or if you have a group that might be interested in doing horticulture therapy at the garden, I would love to chat more about about this. So thank you guys for your time and for listening. And if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. I am so inspired. Oh my gosh. I feel like I was hanging on your every word, Erica. It was absolutely oh. incredible. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I have just re such renewed hope. Like I think it's been a tough couple of years you guys have persevered through many challenges. Um, so many. And in my 16 years in my job, I know that LYG has had so many different locations. And your newest location, which is on First Street behind Boys and Girls Club, is that yes. correct in mm -hmm. Loveland? So if you ever stop by, it is a wonderful location. And it seems to be a permanent home, which is wonderful. And just so many things. So. Um, I would love any questions that people have. Um, actually, there's such a small group that I will allow you to unmute yourself or start your video if you want to do that. Uh, so please come on if you have any questions for Erica. And I think the big takeaway is that if you are a master gardener, we really do this with a lot of what we do. And I think, you know, you're talking about major transformations, Erica, but I think even just little things that we do for people is still therapy there. So I had a student whose parent uh, reached out to me and said, my student has learned more about science in three months with you than he has learned in his entire high school education. And he's a junior. Um, I think our kids learn, I mean, the small things that we see, the belonging, a sense of community, being accepted as you are, that's what our garden provides them that place to be. So it's pretty powerful. I love the background, Erica. It doesn't look like my house. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, I wish. I'm so tired of being cold. Uh, this is actually a shot from last year from the back end of our garden um, looking out. Um, and so these are some of uh, the kids' reg uh, beds behind me. Um, and some of the pictures that you saw in the garden are from um, uh, our, new, our new place. It was an abandoned BMX site that the boys and girls owned. It was 0.6 of an acre. And right when, um, in October of 2020, uh, we built this garden. And so it has been in a labor of love. I have learned more than I wanted to know about how to do all those things. And so, um, yeah, it's beautiful. I encourage you guys all to come out. Maybe we could do like a team building activity out there. A little horticulture therapy for all our master gardeners. That'd be so great. And I know you've added bees and will be or have added chickens. We have chickens. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, yep. and I think you're getting hives this summer. So we have hives. We already have two and they're still alive. I just had a, a reading out there to see because I don't know. I was looking a little, a little skeptical. So if they survive, I feel I will feel like I need to go buy a lotto ticket. And but. a cut flower garden this year. We will have a cut flower garden and um, we're opening a small CSA um, just so our kids can learn that kind of 
business idea. So it'll be 10 shares. It'll be the vegetables that we grow. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how to run a CSA. Let me tell you, I learned a lot really quick on the fly. Um, but it's a great way for our kids to learn about the whole process, you know, growing the vegetables, cutting it, storing it, and then how do we sell it to people in our community. Do you think, Erica, the restaurants are coming back that you'll be able to sell your herbs again? We're hoping to. Um, I think so. I, I think herbs, we have an herb plan. We will be selling a lot of herbs. So we're hoping that our restaurants will reach out to us. We have three in our area, Henry's, uh, Fresh lo a Fresh Plate, and also Origins. And so um, they are interested in doing something like that with us again. Right. That's and great. we'll also be at Farmer's Market. We're hoping to be at three different Farmer's Markets this year so the kids can have that opportunity to interact with the community as well. That's great. You did a yeah. great job. Thank you so oh. much. Yeah, thank you. I love it. It has been, um, I call it my soul work because I think I get just as much if not more than our kids do. It has been such a beautiful place to be during these two years um, and to build something so that so many people could come back and utilize. So it's, it's been awesome. And I know that you will accept teachers who have oh. a specialty area who would like to come in and do a subject matter. Um, yes. I know Janine, you're on with the, obviously the Wild Master Gardeners and the Treasure Island group. So I'm sure that Erica, if you ever want to implement some of these techniques with programming you're already doing, I think it would be such a great collaboration. So. Yes, we are very lucky. So our new site is, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Loveland, but there is gonna be a new park. It's called the Willow Bend Park. It's for 60 acres. And um, and it has a beautiful, like uh, some uh, like a bunch of trees and there's uh, some fishing docks. And so we will be doing a lot of kind of going out back there to explore. Um, I like to do a lot of mindful activities. And so, um, yes, always looking for people to come in and teach us more about birding or any, you name it. So um, if anybody needs volunteer hours. <laughs> okay, cool. I'm going back to transplanting and dividing dahlias. Oh, fun. <laughs> Bye, Bye, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>